From today's eyes, it looks like an antiquated, old piece of equipment. But the printing press was a truly revolutionary technology, as influential as, say, the development of the internet in our time. And in many ways, the printing press is the origin of what we call mass communication. And it's where we'll begin our journey through the history of mass media. But for a minute, let's step back, way back in time. First, we have the development of writing. Early forms of pictographic communication, which were basically little drawings, had been used for tens of thousands of years by human beings. Draw a picture of a flower, it means a flower. Yet you can imagine how limited this form of communication would be. How do you communicate complex ideas through simple pictures? It would be kind of like speaking only in emojis, uh, which maybe some of you do. Scholars generally agree that the earliest form of writing appeared about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, which is present-day Iraq. One of the earliest forms of character-based writing was cuneiform, which to me still looks as beautiful as it does mysterious. Later, this developed into alphabetical writing systems, such as in the Western tradition. With writing came early written works, first carved in stones or scratched in wood or painted on animal skins, and later, types of early paper-like materials like papyrus. This helped lead to the creation of scrolls, parchment, and eventually, early forms of books. But here's, here's the problem. Scrolls and early books were just extremely expensive to make. They had to be copied by hand, tediously, on very expensive parchment, which was made from animal skin. It could take up to a year to make a single copy of a book. The high expense of that material and labor meant that only the wealthiest elite of society could make and reproduce books. So for example, in medieval Europe, the vast majority of books were created by the, by the church, copied by hand by scribes, and were limited primarily to religious texts. At this point, very few people were literate, meaning could read or write. Most people lived in an oral culture in which they communicated almost exclusively through spoken language and used their memories for record keeping. You can kind of imagine how that might not always work out so well. So this is where the printing press comes in, at least in the European context. Speaking of which, let's take a quick detour to Asia, specifically China, where the very first technology for printing developed. Printing began in China using hand-carved woodblocks, and about a thousand years ago in China, Bi Sheng developed the first known movable type system for printing around 1040 AD. This, this system later spread to Korea and Japan, uh, which also developed a strong tradition of printing. In Europe, it wouldn't be until the 1440s when a German metalsmith named Johannes Gutenberg created the very first mechanical printing press. Using a set of metal movable type, this printing press enabled printers to cheaply and rapidly produce identical copies of a page. Instead of taking a year to copy a single book, the printing press could churn out hundreds or thousands of books and at a fraction of the cost. Printing press shops popped up all throughout Europe, and soon, this new technology was used to spread political and religious commentary through the spread of mass-printed pamphlets. The printing press was, ultimately, the first mass communication technology, with the ability to reproduce and spread printed word at an unprecedented speed and quantity. This new technology was set to disrupt the status quo and create a new world where ideas and words could spread and transform society. A few decades after the invention of the printing press, as the printed word was spreading across Europe, a German priest and theologian named Martin Luther had grown critical of the power of the Catholic Church. And in 1517, he wrote his 95 Theses in which he criticized the church's selling of indulgences. Essentially, Luther was calling the church hierarchy corrupt, uh, among many other criticisms and reforms that Luther called for. Using the new media technology of the printing press, Luther's complaints were mass printed, and within a month, uh, thousands of copies had spread across Europe. Uh, an incredible speed 
given the very slow speed of information at the time. Luther's printed criticisms of the church were, relatively speaking, a kind of viral content that spread rapidly throughout Europe, being replicated and spread by the printing press. Luther also printed the Latin Bible in the vernacular in German, which was forbidden by the Catholic Church, and Luther argued that every man should read the Bible in his own language and make his own interpretations of the Word of God, which was directly against the view of the Catholic Church. Luther's ideas sparked major theological battles as supporters and detractors battled it out in the public arena, printing pamphlets and spreading printed propaganda. Luther was eventually excommunicated or kicked out of the church, but his words had already lit a fire of reform that would become the Protestant Reformation, which indirectly challenging the authority of the Pope led to a major split among Christians into Protestants and Catholics, the two major Christian sects that we still have today. As this story shows us, the printing press and its ability to cheaply and quickly produce words and ideas was a, a really powerful and transformative technology, which led to a flourishing of ideas throughout Europe and helped give rise to the foundations of our modern world. One of these transformations that the printing press generated was the creation of national languages. Today, we think about languages as reflecting nations. People in Spain speak Spanish, people in France speak French, and so on and so on. Yet that's not really what languages were like for most of human history. There were no national languages spoken by millions. In fact, there were no nations or countries to speak of. Instead, there were dialects within different linguistic groupings, which were connected to networks of villages, towns, or city-states. In, say, in a land area we now call Germany, for example, you would have had dozens of different Germanic dialects, different languages that had some similarity, but were also quite different. Or in the area we now call France, there were many different Francophone dialects, and so on and so on. But it was a headache and quite expensive for printers to create books in many different dialects. So over time, dominant dialects were used to print books in a singular language, and dictionaries were printed, which froze an otherwise fluid and changing language into an authoritative and universal language. So in a sense, printing books in a single language encouraged millions of people spread over a large area to speak a singular language, which we now refer to as things like English, French, German, and Russian, etc. But in creating these large, unified linguistic groups through printing tons of newly printed books and other printed material, the printing press also created an early sense of what we could call national identity, which helped establish clear national boundaries and later nation states. Not long ago, what we call countries really just didn't exist, but with printed unified languages came fixed, clear national boundaries. People in this uh, given land here now speak French, and over time that place developed literal borders from which we would get nations or countries. So people on one side of a border could speak, say, French, and people on the other side of that same border would then speak German, and so on for countries as they created these fixed kind of linguistic boundaries. It is all a little bit arbitrary when you think about it, isn't it? The printing press was also essential to the development of modern science. Humans have always been curious about the natural world, and there are many types of early science-like writings and observations. Yet the printing press enabled these early science-like observers to share their observations and experiments in a standardized manner, sending them to like-minded others in faraway lands. This helped create the foundation for the scientific method. And at the heart of modern science is this idea of reproducibility. So for science to progress, many scientists must read about experiments or observations and then reproduce those findings. Uh, in successfully doing so, scientific truths can thus emerge. So by printing those observations and experiments in books, which could be easily and cheaply reproduced and spread widely, 
the printing press helped develop an early network or community of scientists and enabled the modern scientific method to become established. Moreover, books, no longer solely for the church, became plentiful and full of this new curious scientific mindset, helping to popularize secular or non-religious explanations for the natural world. Galileo Galilei, a 17th century Italian astronomer, was a perfect example of this new tension between this new kind of scientific mentality and the old world. Galileo was foundational to, to the development of the scientific method and helped develop modern physics. Yet it was his scientific observation that the world was not the center of the universe, that the earth was actually revolving around the sun, which really got him into trouble with the church. In 1610, Galileo published his observations in Sidereus Annuncius, which is Latin for starry messenger, um, which he developed into a claim that the earth was actually orbiting around the sun, building on a model developed earlier by Nicolaus Copernicus. The religious authority, the Catholic Church, believed incorrectly that the earth was the center of the solar system or really the center of the universe. So Galileo was arrested for these writings and forbidden to teach and put under house arrest where he actually remained until his death. But the printed works of Galileo, Copernicus, or any scientist who challenged the religious explanations for the natural world were easily reproduced and spread, helping to usher in a new age guided by science and reason. In the two centuries following the invention of the printing press, new ideas about science and philosophy spread widely and ultimately formed the basis of an intellectual flourishing we today call the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, in which radical new ideas would take root. For example, the idea that individuals had rights and should be able to discuss and help determine the affairs of government helped lead to the birth of uh, constitutional republics instead of monarchies. And in this time, revolutions would sweep the continent, driven by, the, by this idea that men should determine their own destiny. There was, of course, a violent reaction and suppression from kings and other monarchs to this idea. Just speaking out against a king could bring brutal consequences. In 1663, a London printer named John Twin published an anonymously written pamphlet titled A Treatise on the Execution of Justice that challenged the concept of divine right, the idea that monarchs were appointed by God. The pamphlet argued that kings and queens should be accountable to the people. In response, he was arrested uh, convicted of seditious libel and sentenced to uh, a truly horrible death, to be hung, drawn, and quartered. His sentence declared, You shall be hanged by the neck, and being alive, shall be cut down, and your privy members shall be cut off. Your entrails shall be taken from your body, and you living, the same to be burnt before your eyes. Despite the efforts to suppress these radical books and pamphlets, the ideas of the, of the Enlightenment would continue to spread. Ultimately, by making possible new patterns of knowledge development, storage, and distribution, printing ultimately helped foster the scientific revolution and the development of constitutional governmental systems based on the rights of man and in opposition to the divine right of kings thereby advancing the secularization of society and undermining the power of royalty, aristocracy, and the church. In a sense, the printing press helped destroy the old world of kings and religious authority and helped create the foundations for a new society based on constitutional republics, science, and reason. This intellectual flourishing took place in saloons, in coffee houses and other public spaces, where men would read printed books, journals, and pamphlets. People were really hungry for new and radical ideas, which were debated and discussed widely. 
Communication theorist Jürgen Habermas has written extensively about this time period and developed uh, a theory about what he called the public sphere. That is, this flourishing of ideas spread through printed material helped create a radical new form of democratic discourse. Before the Enlightenment, Europe was a feudal social system with lords, kings, and the church at the top of the hierarchy. And pretty much everybody else was at the bottom, as, you know, peasants and serfs. So these elite nobles made all the decisions about governance. They owned all the land and they controlled basically all the wealth. Average people had really no say in public affairs. But as Habermas pointed out, driven by the cheap and widespread availability of the printed word, a growing class of merchants and other non-nobles created this new space of discourse and debate, where what mattered was not your family name or your status in the social hierarchy, but rather the, the quality of your argument, the, the soundness of your reason and logic. This Habermasian public sphere would help create the foundations for our democratic societies, where men would determine their own fate through discourse, deliberations, and election of representative governments. Of course, as has been noted by scholars like Nancy Fraser, these democratic rights were extended exclusively to men, and typically only white landowning men at that. Women, the poor, and non-whites, especially slaves in slaveholding countries, were entirely shut out of this early form of democracy and public discourse. In summary, looked at from today's vantage point, the printing press might look like a pretty meager piece of machinery. Yet, it created a hugely transformative revolution in communication which, over the centuries, created the possibilities for totally new ways of understanding and living in the world. Science, secular thought, national identity, philosophy, democratic governance, and much more would create the very foundation for our idea-rich modern worlds.